Hello, everyone. My name is Jason. I'm a resident in the Harvard Combined Orthopedics Residency Program. And today I'll be giving a talk on fracture related infection pathophysiology and diagnosis. I have no relevant disclosures. In terms of objectives today, we're going to review the pathophysiology of fracture related infections and understand the diagnostic criteria for FRIs. So, fracture related infections are a devastating complication following orthopedic trauma with infection rates of about 1% and 2% for closed fractures and up to 30% for open fractures. Risk factors include male gender, having a history of diabetes or smoking history, being a polytrauma patient, having a lower extremity fracture, and having a higher injury severity based on the Gustio Anderson classification. Universal prevention and treatment guidelines are unavailable, um, and so uh, FRIs pose a unique diagnostic and clinical challenge. Um, the clinical challenge really then is lies in a timely and accurate diagnosis of FRIs and separating FRI signs and symptoms from those of normal fracture healing. And then in terms of management, adequately addressing biofilms to eliminate infection and minimize infection recurrence. So why do we care? Um, FRIs are estimated to have a greater total disease burden than prosthetic joint infections. And there is a higher incidence in low income and middle income countries accounting for uh, about 14 to 23 percent of open fractures. Treatment costs are many fold times higher uh, in infected fractures as compared to uninfected ones. And having an FRI is associated with having a longer hospital length of stay, prolonged recovery and loss of function, which may be permanent. Patients with FRIs also have lower quality of life scores, mental and physical health scores and a worse functional uh, worse functional outcome scores. Uh, when FRIs are established, recurrence rates are also high, occurring in 6 to 9% of patients after treatment, uh, with uh, amputations being required in 3 to 5% of these patients. Um, additionally, management is different than for other major orthopedic infections, say for prosthetic joint infections, as hardware um, removal is a possibility in the treatment algorithm. Um, and for FRIs, there's more varied anatomy. Uh, it's also associated with soft tissue injury and uh, can be associated with polytrauma as well. So, um, uh, and beyond all this, diagnosing FRIs can be challenging, especially early on when symptoms may overlap with the normal healing response after trauma. In terms of the pathogenesis, um, most FRIs begin from penetrating trauma preoperatively or uh, via inoculation and con from contamination during the uh, initial surgery. Uh, FRIs can also be a sequelae of treatment. Uh, for example, contamination on the fixation device, wound healing complications, or delayed soft tissue coverage. Uh, typically, hematogenous seeding is, is considered rare. The most common organism is Staph aureus. Staph aureus or C. acnes are also known causative organisms of late onset infections. And then poly, polymicrobial infections can occur with open fractures, and these often include environmental pathogens such as Clostridium aeromonas and Pseudomonas species. Overall infection leads to decreased bony union and osteolysis, bacterial biofilm formation, and a heightened inflammatory response. And here's just a table showing some of the most common microorganisms uh, in fracture-related infections. So staph aureus really is the, the most common, and then coagulase negative staph is another common cause, followed by enterocacti, uh, anaerobes, and streptococci. So this is a little bit of a busy slide, um, um, but um, uh, I just wanted to talk about it a little bit because um, it provides a nice overview of the pathophysiology for how infections affect the bony response and why they cause um, the constellation of symptoms uh, uh, and problems that they do. And this is taken from Moriarty et al. in Nature Reviews from 2022. Um, so really, you know, you know, this is a lot to go over, but in summary, um, bacteria have several mechanisms for disrupting the normal healing response and establishing infection. One being uh, some can express surface uh, components that which promote adhesion to abiotic surfaces, promoting biofilm formation, for example, on the fixation device. Some can express things like surface protein A, which can facilitate intracellular infection into host cells. Uh, some bacteria can also secrete pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs, uh, 
uh, that are recognized by immune cells and uh, stimulate a pro-osteoclastogenic cytokine uh, response, as well as bony resorption. Uh, some bacteria secrete toxins, which can directly mediate osteoblast cell death. And then in the case of Staph aureus, Staph aureus can form microabscesses, which contribute to bacterial persistence and sustain a local inflammatory response that promotes osteolysis. And they can co uh, colonize the osteocyte lacuna canicular network, which promotes osteocyte death. So overall, then, the, the bacteria then produce a pro-inflammatory osteoclastogenic environment, which limits bone healing, promotes bacterial persistence, uh, as well as um, uh, killing off local um, uh, osteocytes and osteogenic cells. And this is just a kind of summary of that. So on the top half, you see normal fracture healing response characterized by hematoma formation, then early callus, then hard callus. Um, but in fracture-related infections, what you have is inoculation of bacteria with the initial fracture or index surgery. These bacteria then ad adhere to abiotic surfaces, form a biofilm, and um, promote an inflammatory response, which involves neutrophil recruitment, um, inflammation, uh, and impaired uh, bone formation. And subsequently, this leads to osteoclast activation, bony erosion, osteolysis, um, and uh, cell death of osteoblasts, and then ultimately uh, non-union sequester formation and chronic infection. Uh, in terms of prevention strategies, um, early antibiotic prophylaxis is protective against FRI. Uh, typically, first-generation cephalosporin is adequate for Gustavia Anderson type 1 or 2 open fracture. Uh, there's limited evidence to support adding gram-negative coverage for Gustavia Anderson 3 injuries, uh, and the duration of this treatment remains controversial. Early soft tissue coverage can mitigate uh, infection risk. So some guidelines suggest coverage of open fractures should occur within 72 hours and no later than seven days after injury, as a delay of over seven days can risk uh, recurrent infection. And then some recent evidence suggests that open fractures can benefit from the addition of local antibiotics into the wound itself uh, via something like antibiotic cement. This is just a summary of, of some of that information that was just provided. So as you know, as you go down here, the fracture open fracture severity increases, infection risk increases, and your treatment algorithm should uh, change. So with closed fractures, a single dose of prophylactic antibiotics is usually effective for type one and two open fractures. Uh, systemic antibiotic prophylaxis can be helpful for the first 24 hours. And then for type three fractures, there is tissue damage, vascular damage, et cetera. Um, so systemic antibiotic perfusion is reduced. So um, perioperative uh, systemic antibiotic prophylaxis uh, usually is extended up to about 48 to 72 hours or until wound closure. And then local antibiotics should also be considered as an adjunct. In terms of diagnosis, um, there is no uniform diagnostic criteria for uh, or standardized treatment protocols for FRI. Recent proposed consensus FRI definitions from the AL Foundation and the European Bone and Joint Infection Society are what I'm going to talk about today, and they provide a kind of overview of what to consider. Uh, these are largely based on expert opinion in the consensus definition, um, and there's to date no quantified predictive value of any one given element on the diagnostic criteria. The diagnostic criteria um, are, uh, you know, temporally sp uh, spaced, so it's sort of more of a multi-stage process uh, that depends on patient signs and symptoms, as well as laboratory values and intraoperative findings and culture. Um, and then these findings are typically divided into suggestive and confirmatory signs and symptoms of FRI or laboratory imaging findings. So in terms of signs and symptoms, uh, you know, local pain, heat, redness, and swelling, as well as fever are only considered suggestive of FRI. A lot of these uh, overlap with some of the same responses that are seen with normal fracture healing. What can be deduced as a confirmatory uh, sign on exam really is frank purulent drainage or having a draining sinus uh, or observation of frank pus during surgery or evidence of wound dehiscence or breakdown. In terms of laboratory values, um, serum inflammatory markers have to be interpreted with caution in the setting of trauma. Uh, uh, but some things that can be suggestive here are 
a secondary rise of inflammatory markers after initial decrease uh, that may suggest um, a brewing infection or having a persistently elevated inflammatory uh, marker levels over time uh, that do not decrease with uh, resolution of the initial trauma response. Um, usually ESR, CRP, and leukocyte count are insufficient to make a diagnosis of FRI um, as these do not have um, adequate diagnostic value based on several meta-analyses. So uh, really serum inflammatory markers are not confirmatory. Histology can be confirmatory if there are presence of microbes on histology from intraoperative deep cultures, or if there are more than five uh, neutrophils uh, per high-powered field in cases of chronic infection. This has been shown to have 100% specificity for an FRI. Um, so, um, and having an absence of neutrophils on high-powered field is also predictive of an aseptic non-union Again, in cases uh, of uh, you know, when you're suspecting a chronic uh, FRI or uh, aseptic nonunion. PCR and next-gen sequencing are you know, used in the lab. Um, highly sensitive, though not really, really widely applied yet in the clinical setting for FRI management, and so their evidence for their use remains limited. In terms of microbiology, um, having one positive culture from a tissue or implant sample is typically only considered suggestive, as this could just be a sign of a contaminant. What's considered confirmatory for an FRI is if you have positive cultures of the same pathogen from two separate tissue or implant samples, and these are samples taken intraoperatively. Typically, swabs are not considered sensitive enough, so these are typically not used. Really, tissue or implant cultures, uh, deep, deep, deep tissue or deep implant cultures are preferred. When uh, just a couple notes on taking tissue samples, as this can help your infectious disease colleagues as well as the lab. Um, consensus guidelines recommend taking at least five deep samples from different sites or implants to avoid sampling error, uh, given that um, bacterial growth can be quite geographic and localized. So taking samples uh, with unused instruments for each sample is also important to avoid cross-contamination. Uh, and another uh, element here is intraoperatively minimizing manipulation of the target area to uh, keep it from being contaminated can be helpful. Um, and here, when I say contaminated, I mean um, you know spreading the infection around to areas where the the, the, um, the infection may not may not exist. Um, typically, one recommends stopping antibiotic therapy two weeks before sampling tissues for bacterial culture. Um, do, uh, we typically do not take swabs from sinus tracts, as this is usually just contaminated with skin flora. Uh, and again, swabs are not recommended if they're not very sensitive. Uh, additionally, fine needle aspirations, not recommended either. Um, blood cultures um, should be taken in the case of fever, but have low yield for chronic FRIs. So that's something to keep in mind, um, that blood cultures may not um, have adequate sensitivity for FRI diagnosis in chronic cases. Um, and typically, right after sampling is complete, we recommend initiating antibiotics so as not to delay uh, further treatment. In terms of sample processing, it is important to specify if you are concerned um, in a chronic infection case about CACNES to hold the cultures for 14 days, as this can help detect indolent infections. Um, one also has to process samples or have the lab process samples individually, so it's not to pool the specimens in order to ensure that you can confirm that you have a diagnosis of FRI and that it's not just contaminant. Um, when, uh, typically in the lab, uh, one should uh, culture the, the any suspected organisms in an enriched media to detect indolent infections. And then for implant samples, um, sonicating these samples, which is uh, where they undergo um, Microvibration in an ultrasound bath can help dislodge biofilms and facilitate microbe identification, but the scientific evidence uh, remains limited for this practice, um, so it's not typically done. In terms of imaging principles, really the goal of imaging is to help determine the presence or absence of FRI or to help visualize the degree uh, of disease extension for surgical planning, such as you know identifying sequestrae, cloacae, sinus tracts, subcortical abscesses, etc. Uh, and they can also help determine the degree of fracture healing, which has implications for management. There are different modalities 
depending on the practice location uh, and country. Um, some may be more used than others. Typically, X-ray is still the first line. CT and MRI um, being um, your kind of next step in terms of advanced imaging for three-dimensional uh, assessment. And then there are um, kind of more uh, uh, sophisticated forms of imaging, such as a three-phase bone scan. This is typically not recommended. It's highly sensitive and not very specific. Um, FDG PET uh, is not really useful for the detection of acute uh, fracture-related infection. These are, um, as you know, having uh, an FRI within one month of surgery, um, it, it won't be able to detect um, or separate um, post-surgical changes uh, and active healing response from FRI. Uh, white blood cell uh, scintigraphy um, can be useful. And the key element here is that its accuracy is not influenced by surgery, but it is very resource intensive and time intensive, um, uh, and it tends to be less accurate in the axial skeleton. So um, a tool in the toolbox, but uh, certainly not, not something to reach for first. So in terms of imaging, there are um, several uh, things that one can note to be suggestive. There's really no evidence that uh, there are any confirmatory signs on imaging, uh, and there's also no evidence that any one imaging modality is better than the other. Um, so some suggestive signs can be signs of implant loosening, bony lysis, non-union, sequestration, and periosteal bone formation. MRIs can help delineate soft tissue involvement uh, if they're sinus tracts or abscesses. And then those nuclear imaging findings that I discussed can be helpful. Some in some studies can be uh, often shown to be more uh, accurate than MRI for FRI detection. So again, very resource and time intensive, um, and these need to be taken into account before reaching for those tools. And there's a great summary here of the imaging modalities. Um, Morgan Stern's paper and injury from uh, 2018, uh, in case anyone's interested. Uh, so this is just a summary table here then of the diagnostic criteria for FRI infection, the confirmatory uh, signs and symptoms, as well as laboratory and histology findings on the left, and then suggestive signs, laboratory findings and imaging uh, on the right. And then here is just the summative algorithm um, to help you decide on the diagnosis of FRI. So again, confirmatory criteria are required for a definitive FRI diagnosis and suggestive criteria should prompt you um, to increase your clinical suspicion, but are not uh, adequate on their own for an FRI diagnosis. So in conclusion, fracture-related infections are a diagnostic and clinical challenge, um, and they remain a major problem for fracture management, especially for open fractures. There are no uniform diagnostic criteria or standardized treatment protocols for FRI, um, though there are some now uh, consensus guidelines, which I just uh, discussed, um, to help with um, FRI diagnosis. Confirmatory findings based on these expert consensus include a sinus tract, wound dehiscence, or frank pus, or purulent drainage, two or more separate deep cultures, uh, growing identical bacterial organisms, histological presence of bacteria from deep culture, or having greater than five neutrophils per high power field in chronic to late cases of FRI. Uh, and again, imaging findings are not considered confirmatory. So that is it for me. Thank you very much.